Well, a very good morning to you, uh, colleagues, um, to this uh, next keynote session. Uh, I'm Gary McCulloch, and it's my uh, great pleasure to be uh, chairing this session today with two of the very leading lights of uh, 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 educational research community, uh, Mary James and Andrew Pollard. Uh, they've both been uh, awarded the uh, John Nisbet uh, Fellowship uh, which we can celebrate with them uh, at this uh, conference. Marvelous lifetime achievements, each of them. Tremendous contributions uh, to, to educational research, uh, which, which they've both made. And they also uh, uh, teamed up to uh, lead probably one of the most important educational research initiatives of the last 30 years in this country, the Teaching and Learning uh, Research Program uh, funded by the uh, uh, ESRC. Um, they'll be making this a kind of conversation under five different headings, and following which they, they think that they may have time for questions and further conversation with, with this uh, uh, group as, as a whole. So we'll see how we go. And the title is Head, Heart, hands, happenstance, and horror. Some reflections on being educational researchers. Great pleasure to welcome Mary Jones and Andrew Pollard. Um, I'm a bit nervous at this being called a keynote because one expects a, a lecture. And this is um, supposed to be a conversation and we don't know how it's going to go, really. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to split it into, you know, um, a few minutes each. We want it to be a conversation, and we are quite familiar with butting into each other. So I hope that we'll be able to do this. But how it goes, I really have no idea <laughs> at the moment. We chose this... Whoops. Okay. Have I pressed that, or did you press that? It's okay. <laughs> okay. We've chosen these... Um, uh, alliterative headings, really, because they did seem to sum up some of the, if you like, the major themes of uh, long careers in education and educational research. And I should say education because both Andrew and I were teachers for some substantial time before we went into um, before we went into research. I taught in secondary schools for ten years, and Andrew taught in primary schools for ten years. 10 years, so, you know, and that was a really very formative experience for us, uh, both in terms of our, our practice and our research. Um, the first thing we thought we'd talk about is head, you know, and I think it's inescapable that most of the work that researchers do is actually in isolation. It's quite quiet work. It's actually in your study when you're actually thinking and reading and learning. Um, and that actually is possibly hidden from most people's view. Um, I think that probably that happens most when you're a very early researcher, when you're doing your PhD. I know that in my case, doing my master's and my PhD, those were the times when I actually spent most time in the library reading, subsequent after being a, a lecturer and so forth. There were lots of meetings and there were lots of um, other activities that one got involved with. So I think the early career research is absolutely crucial to that. But it really is important that one learns throughout one's life um, in those areas. And I think increasingly as the, the field of research is changing, there's a need really to widen one's experience constantly. And I think we are in an area now that if we actually deal with the complex nature of research questions in the educational field, then we have to have a multidisciplinary approach. Now, I don't know if Steve and Gorard is here. He talked about the complex researcher. I'm a little bit skeptical about whether any single individual can be a complex researcher, but I do think that it's important to be as literate as one can be across a whole range of, of, of methodologies, really. And it's, in some senses, it does argue for multidisciplinary teams of people to work with. And I think in my own career, I've worked with other people mostly. I've done very little, actually, as a solitary researcher. I'm going to hand over to Andrew. Thanks, Marie. Um, I wanted to sort of 
inject a, a bit of the historical context in a way. And I thought I could take as a, as a, a way of doing this Pat Thompson's analysis of Bourdieu, which she provided us with yesterday. Uh, she presented education as a contested field and showed us a slide of a game of women's rugby. Now, if only the field of education was um, you know, contested by women, we might have got somewhere, perhaps. <laughs> but, but unfortunately, it isn't. And we've had a number of bullish men around. And I feel that, um, you know, looking back over the past 50 years or so, in some ways, um, I have been engaged in um, a bit of a game of rugby um, with, with some of these individuals o over the years. But it does start with head. And, and the role of theory and one's sort of perspective on the world, I think, is very, very important. And for me, it all started back in 1968 when I began a, a degree studying sociology at the University of Leeds, just over the hill. Um, and there was a guy there called Alan Dorr who published a paper called The Two Sociologies, all about the sociology of order and sociology of control. And that led me into thinking about subjectivity and action and the interaction between individuals and society. And it led me to C. Wright Mills. Um, it led me to understanding biography and the way in which we fit into our context. Um, and the way in which you know, what we do has implications for what we become, indeed, what our society becomes. And um, I feel that my head work, if you like, has, has all kind of you know, teased out from those beginnings. Um, so, in some ways, the work I've done most recently, um, including our analysis from TLRP of, of teaching and learning and the principles and all that work, I can see echoes of what was in my PhD back in 1981, which, uh, and there was a paper about coping strategies, which was in BJSE, which set that up. And that goes back to um, my MED, which was 1976. And that goes back to my struggles in the classroom uh, in uh, Dewsbury uh, over in Yorkshire where the you know there were these children who I needed you know there were only five and um, but my goodness it took me a long while to work out how to um, you know relate to them properly and, and work with them because they were coming from particular socio historical circumstances material circumstances and and I needed to make those connections and so forth um, uh, and one is immediately then confronted by the challenge of what society thinks one should teach them, the subject knowledge, if you like, and the importance of trying to make a connection with them so that that becomes possible. And those themes, of course, have, have followed us all the way. So my um, you know, affirmation of what you've said about head um, is really to um, absolutely agree with it and think of it in that broader mm. kind of context. Um, and I think we are still... Uh, we think of ourselves, you know, we, we're reflecting back on what is essentially 50 years of, of, of playing rugby in the field. But I'm kind of aware, <laughs> you may not think... Uh, well, we were rugby, uh, Mary's definitely. riding yeah. her horse around the field. But, but nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, the field will go on. We, 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 we're pausing at a moment of history today, but there is another 50 years to come and beyond that. And there will be colleagues in the room who, who you know, we never can be removed from, from our historical context. I guess that's it. Um, and the, um, the, 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 the ideas, the reflective qualities, the, um, the way in which we make sense of our evidence and, and, and so on, it, it provides that kind of foundation for how one engages in that field, how you throw the ball about. I think we have a common, uh, quite a common sort of intellectual um, legacy of tradition, really, in, in so far as mine wasn't quite so dependent on perhaps uh, C. Wright Mills. But I went back to Dewey, I think, really, and Brunner, and there was still that yeah. transactional analysis between yeah. the individual agency and the structure. And for, for the same reason, it had resonances with me when you're working in, in schools. I worked in three different schools in very different circumstances secondary modern, <laughs> girls' grammar school, and comprehensive. And you saw those interactions all the time, and yeah. what children were able to achieve was so dependent on, on influences from the structure and their sense of self-agency. And the most formative, I think, experience in my early, when I was a teacher, was being sent on a course by my head, who was quite a visionary, 
uh, at the girls' grammar school to um, sit at the feet of Lawrence Sternhouse and be trained as an HDP teacher, which yeah. I then did bring back into my classroom. And I taught that for two years, if you can call it teaching it. But it was important for those particular groups of children that the head had identified as feeling that they were failures. And this was in a grammar school, you yeah. know. But they didn't do as well as some of the A streamers. And so she said they need a totally different pedagogical experience. And that was a really formative yeah. influence. One other Can we thing move on to heart? We need to yeah, OK. <laughs> One Mary, thing Mary told me before we began that we had four minutes on each of these yeah, topics. Right. So we're at, we're to make it so, a conversation. So, so I'm, I'm doing the heart, aren't I? So, so I was, um, you know, sort of towards the end of the 80s and or beginnings of the 80s and something, I was still, uh, you know, playing f relatively routine rugby in the education field. And then things started to change because Jim Callaghan and Margaret Thatcher decided that the rules should be torn up. Instead of respecting education professionals and letting them get on with it, uh, there was to be uh, a new curriculum, there was to be new forms of assessment, there were to be uh, new forms of inspection. And um, the players all had to smarten up a bit. Uh, and the Education Reform Act 1988 um, ensured that they did. And um, so the question then is, what, what, what does one do about that? Well, I can identify at least two things that, that I tried to, to contribute to that, which were things of the heart. They were driven by values, really. Mm -hmm. um, one was um, assembling what I hoped was some sort of sense of our collective knowledge into the book called Reflective Teaching in the Primary School, which I did with a colleague called Sarah Tan. I did under the, with, enabled by a guy called John Isaacs at Oxford Polytechnic, who was a visionary, really, in how this sort of thing. I mean, I think I probably implemented John's ideas more than anything, um, but, but he, was, he was very, very good on that. And the idea of that book was to keep the flag flying for an independent professionalism, uh, teachers exercising judgment um, and so forth, in the context of which the system was tightening. Um, the other thing I was able to do was, was to get some funds together to um, uh, run a project called uh, the PACE Project, Primary Assessment Curriculum Experience, which evaluated the impact of the national curriculum on, on primary schools, particularly on pupils and, and on teachers. And it showed how the system was tightening that field of play and beginning to constrain um, teachers and thus affect the way in which they could relate to pupils. And of course, that, that was the beginning of a process which has kind of carried on. And I kind of, you know, when one's looking at improvement, there's improvement of practice of, of, of our professional work, which is absolutely essential and needs to go on and on. But unfortunately, we've also got the question of how we relate to the broader context and of societal expectations, whether they're um, you know, presented by parents or by governments. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that is... So we have to think, well, what sort of improvement are we looking for in a contested field? And Becca summarised it with whose side are you on? And I don't think we can kind of remove ourselves from that question, really. So values and the heart uh, seems to me to be, um, whether we like it or not, inextricably bound up with the, with the work that we do. Uh, and Mary? Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I felt very much the same, and I know that there is a, a discussion within Bira and much more broadly about the nature of education. We've seen this today and in Desmond, uh, in, in Dominic's talk yesterday. And, um, you know, I, I too, with Andrew, probably because of my uh, school teaching experience, felt very strongly that I wanted to try to actually improve the situation as far as I could. I know that during, I think it was the 80s and 90s, we had the rise of postmodernism as well, and saying in the context that we're actually working in, you know, are we actually achieving anything? And we can still feel that now. And therefore, can, should we really concentrate on analysis of, w of what, what we're doing? But I still felt, even though um, th the improvements might be minimal, or they might still be accumulative over time. You know, we, I don't think any one initiative actually is likely to transform everything. And I think government makes this mistake, actually, of thinking that there somehow is a silver bullet that we can give everyone and we're going to solve the problems. I don't think that's the way things work. It actually works in an incremental, uh, cumulative way in, in many ways. Um, and I think it's still worth doing. I mean, it can be very depressing, and I've got a st story to tell about how depressing some yeah. of that, my attempts have been to actually 
um, achieve something in, in terms of my research, but I still feel that that's where I've got to, to uh, believe, have a belief in things being able to, to improve, even though powerful elites and so forth are actually having uh, negative uh, influences on curriculum and assessment, particularly, which is my interest and field, really. Um, one of the things I really have, have thought about quite a lot more recently is how do we know that we've made an improvement? This is a big issue, I think, really. How do we know we have got an improvement? It's very complex. And when I started my research career, probably as Andrew, I was a qualitative researcher. Ethnography, ethnography was my um, preference, if you like, and perhaps I went in search of questions that fitted my methods and so forth. But more recently, particularly within the project I had within TLRP, the, teach, uh, the Learning How to Learn project, we tried there because we had a large team of about 17 um, academics from five universities working on that with various backgrounds. We could really think about how best to actually um, not only look at associations between uh, interventions, if you like, and outcomes, but what actually might explain those. And so we could actually combine in some way both qualitative and quantitative research. And that was really, I don't think we achieved everything we wanted to do, but we, it was really important. And, and looking back, one of the key things, um, we had for a short time, we had Dylan William on our team. He was mostly in the States, I think. But Dylan has this capacity to sometimes shift your thinking, kick, to kick you into a different field mm. almost to do that. And we were struggling about our research questions. What are our research questions here? And he had been reading um, uh, Stephen Toomlin, Return to Reason, and said, what we need is a causal model, actually. You know, what we think, how things are actually influenced. And that we actually look at associations, if you like, in a quantitative way between var variables. But we also look at intervening variables, and we do as much as we can statistically. But then we also collect the qualitative data in order to provide some explanations of the associations that we see. And I think that was quite, that really shifted mm. us. And I think in research you do find sometimes something happens that, that does kick you forward, mm. you know, to but try. He was, a, I, he was a rugby player, actually. Yeah, <laughs> quite a robust one, I should imagine. <laughs> Prop, <laughs> but, I think. Was he? But he, it, I mean, you, 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 you fulfilled that design through very much through hands-on uh, yeah. engagement with the data, didn't you? And yeah, I think you're going to say a bit about that because I think that's such an important aspect of educational research that one doesn't lose touch um, with the authentic reality of the classroom setting. Yeah, I mean, you know, to, uh, listening to Pat Thompson yesterday and the, the bifurcation, if you like, between academic and theory and practice has always been a problem to me huge problem to me, largely because I come from an artisan family. I was the only person in my family who had an education past 16. And, you know, my father was a, a skilled joiner, uh, but he also decided to publish, he had published a series of 44 articles on something he called craftsmanship and productivity. So, you know, he integrated the theory and quite a lot of theory, quite a lot of mathematical theory into his work and got very irritated when his neighbor, who was um, a bank clerk, said, well, I think with my head, you think with, uh, you work with your hands. And I always knew when mm. he was very angry because he came in smiling. <laughs> I thought there's something <laughs> wrong here. <laughs> but so I've always had this problem and I actually think about um, what we do in uh, educational research and there's a lot of hands-on stuff. I mean, I was quite pleased looking at all my projects um, that they were working directly in some ways with schools, with teachers, with um, advisors, but with children, sometimes too, with students. And I can remember in one particular project actually doing a course for school students on research methods because the students were going to become the researchers in their schools. So um, there's, a, there's a sense in which there's a hands-on element, I think, to research. And, and there is an element of skill craft, if you like, and art, <laughs> as mm. well as science in this, this sort of field. The other thing about the hands-on thing is about giving a hand up um, mm. to some, or giving a hand to people. And I think it may be, again, because I've experienced being a teacher in schools, that one of the greatest pleasures 
from teaching is actually seeing your own students flourish. Um, and I think that's been a really important thing. And in terms of the opportunities I've had working in multidisciplinary teams and large teams is seeing junior researchers actually taking things and running. And I was thinking about the Learning How to Learn project. And in that, our researchers, there were several researchers, but Dave Pedder is now a professor, and he's taken the instrument that he worked on and teachers' practice and values and developed it and worked with colleagues in the States on a very big review of teacher learning um, and taking those ideas further. Alison Fox, who is possibly here, you know, she's a senior lecturer now at the Open University and she's taken forward the uh, network mapping instruments that she, she worked on in the context of, of uh, this particular project, the Learning How to Learn project, and Pete Dudley also was associated with that project and he's developed his work on lesson study. So I think, you know, there's real pleasure in actually helping people along the way in terms of their careers. And of course, that's one of the things we tried to encourage in TLRP yeah. with a big emphasis on capacity building. And, uh, uh, and, and also, I think there's something to do with the groundedness with authenticity. And uh, Mary's always been a, so good at, at this, really, of, of, of working alongside teachers, uh, respecting them, building on their perspectives and recognizing their expertise. Um, and, and, and fostering cooperation within research teams and so forth. And there has been a period where educational researchers turned on each other a bit, mm. you know, adopting different perspectives and lots of bun fights at conferences and so forth, um, getting quite aggressive sometimes. And it didn't do the field any good at all. I mean, if you are playing rugby, the last thing you want is conflict within your own team. And you have to have kind of respect for each other's expertise. Um, and you have to try to um, build some mutual understandings of strengths and weaknesses and, and what you can all contribute to the greater good as you um, throw the ball about. Um, and we, we certainly need that. Uh, we need to build, not destroy. I was very pleased in that respect to hear Dominic's um, excellent presidential address where he was really arguing that we should be more self-confident um, about the work that we do. And, and that's so that we can go out into the field, which is contested um, by, by um, you know, the, the neoliberal model, if you like, um, and, and be more effective in articulating uh, a principled basis for high quality education. So I think you, know, you and your work in your projects illustrate what we were trying to do more broadly in TLRP, which was to use the program as a, uh, a vehicle for building a more authentic, a grounded, respectful approach to educational improvement. Can we go on to happenstance? <laughs> yeah. Um, happenstance is also um, something I can relate to the uh, to the f struggle in the field. I don't know whether you've, uh, there'll be people here from New Zealand, people here from France, I expect. Now those rugby teams always annoy me because <laughs> <laughs> they're so very good at, um, you know, there's a play going on and you think we're making some progress and somebody does something, the ball is just a little bit higher than it should be and they grab it and rush off down the pitch and score some terribly whizzy goal. Um, well, that happened to me once um, when Charles Deforge decided to resign as the director of TLRP. Um, he resigned for very good reasons. One, one was he wasn't getting on with everybody but the more important one uh, was that uh, um, ESRC insisted on funding projects which were the best by the peer review uh, system, but they weren't the most coherent. And so we had a very mixed portfolio of projects. Um, Charles wanted a more coherent program, and he had perfect, you know, he was, he was right in that in many respects, um, and I respect his, his judgment. But in the end, he got fed up with arguing about this and decided to give it up. And so the ball all of a sudden was up in the air. And so I applied for it. And this is, this is you know, I didn't know it was coming. Nobody did. And a lot of people said, well, you really, uh, you know, you shouldn't do that. Because TLP at the time had been set up to improve educational research. It hadn't, you know, it wasn't a terribly good story. We were bickering amongst ourselves. 
Other people thought the quality of the work was poor, it wasn't connected to, to the reality of pro policy and practice. Uh, you know, it was a big problem. And here, all of a sudden, was this dollar for money that was supposed to make a big difference. Um, well, I grabbed the ball and, and, and had the explicit purpose of trying to turn that round to use those resources, I wouldn't say completely subversively, but it was certainly the case that I, I, I wanted to um, try and find a way of using it, redirecting those resources, so that we could support self-development rather than imposed development. The very first event in TLRP involved the educational researchers who'd gone through this immense competition being lectured by uh, imported researchers from around the world, who were no doubt excellent in their own right, but um, it wasn't kind of, it was a very um, top-down sort of model. Yeah, we were de and desperate to actually talk to one another yeah, because we just it was got very bizarre. grants and we um, couldn't. <laughs> we had a little to uh, All <laughs> documented in the archive, which is lying inside the IOE's uh, um, vault somewhere. Um, but anyway, um, so, but we were able to um, convert the, the program into something which I think had considerable successes in terms of its capacity building. You know, we had this meeting of minds thing. We had all sorts of uh, initiatives funding um, over 100 investments, including projects and thematic work, which brought people together and lots and lots of capacity building activities. Um, surprising what you can do. If you say somebody's got an ESRC award and you give them, you know, a few quid and a bottle of wine, um, all sorts of things can happen. Um, and, 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 and they did. So in terms of capacity building, um, <laughs> uh, it, you know, it, it, was, it was great fun. It was very collegial. Um, I think over 750 researchers in, uh, across the country, in the whole UK, were involved. Um, and it was, a, it was a wonderful thing. And for me, that was a, just a, a chance that came up. I, I, I personally had another one with the REF. Um, I'd been involved in the REF twice before. And when the 2014 thing came up, I'd put my hat in the ring and was subsequently asked to do it. And again, in that instance, there is this game which for years had, had depressed the status of education by not ranking us very strongly. And I thought, well, okay, well, let's see what happens if I can actually become the referee here in this game. And so I was able to work with the sub-panel to encourage it to view the strengths of the work, not the weaknesses. And I was able to work in the main panel which supervises the sub-panel, to articulate the strengths of educational research and relate it, just as Dominic did, to other fields, which are also diverse, which also have strengths and weaknesses. And as you may know, we came out with a proportion of four-star work, which was 30%, which was exactly on the uh, average for the REF for higher education as a whole. So that our reputation is as being comparable to anybody else, which is what the... Um, uh, Chief Executive of ESRC had said in regard to TLRP's work as well. It's as good as anybody's in the world, our best work. Um, but of course, we also needed to, to attend to the close to practice research in the way that Dominic was, was telling us about yesterday. And I was pleased as a spin-off from the REF to be able to try to promote that so that we can take pride in that aspect of our work as well, which I think is, is so important. But it is to do with luck, and it is to do with opportunity, as, as our slide says, and with grabbing it and doing something with it, with hopefully um, some panache. One thing that gives me great pleasure is to see around the room and to see, as I read, you know, research intelligence and other things, people, you know, moving around and starting to do very similar things. And, and the next 50 years is going to require... Um, lots of colleagues to do that. To, again, who knows what the opportunities will be, but people need to be ready to take them. Okay, now what that reveals in, in what Andrew has said is his capacity for strategic thinking. And I think, you know, uh, what Andrew has shown in t uh, TLRP is, is a strategic vision which you don't often see within, within a, an academic community, seeing very much the big picture and linking you know, research to practice to policy and so forth and a larger view. We've often debated you know, why was it that we got on quite well and I think it was probably because there were things that were similar but there were things that were different mm. as well. And I, he, Andrew said to me the other day, you know, um, I think I 
dealt with substance in some ways and content, mm -hmm. and Andrew dealt with the strategic you know, mm -hmm. um, placement and overview to a large extent. So the two things actually came together. But on a much smaller scale, the, the luck thing has been very strong for me as well, because I don't believe I've done... You have a vi vision sometimes of a researcher saying, this is what I want to research, and actually going down that narrow tunnel, really, or corridor. And it's very productive, and I know that some do that. I, I haven't done that right from the beginning. Um, I've sort of been invited on to other people's projects, and that's how I sort of built my career. So at the OU, it was um, Bob McCormick who asked me to do some case studies for a, a course that was being developed. Then Desmond Nuttall and Tricia Brawford asking me if I'd like to be a deputy director of the evaluation of records of achievement schemes. Then there was Colin Connor who was asking me if I'd like to join him on evaluating a national curriculum assessment at Key Stage 1. There was Colleen McLaughlin who asked me if I'd like to join her with work on action research in, in Russia, America and the Netherlands uh, in the area of counselling and guidance. There was Judy here who uh, invited me to join her team working on uh, an evaluation of um, uh, personalised learning. David Hargreaves suggested he and I actually work together on a bid to the SRC for the Learning How to Learn project. We got it, but I mean, he then was, went to the <laughs> um, QCA to head up QCA mm -hmm. temporarily, so he couldn't actually follow that through. Um, then there was Andrew asking me if I'd like to join him on the TLRP, and all of those, and then of course there was the assessment reform group that I belonged to, with mm -hmm. lots of colleagues Very there, important. working on, on a number of co initiatives. So, the challenge for me was how to make sense of all this, really. And when it came to TLRP, with you know 750 colleagues and over 100 uh, projects, in a sense, really, how do you actually make sense of this? Um, and I knew that somebody would say, "Is what has TLRP found out?" And that was the really incentive to actually try to bring these together and develop out of looking across the results of each of these projects to bring together the work into 10 principles of teaching and learning, which I think has actually been quite valuable subsequently. So I'm quite interested in, in my retirement, in weaving. I've no much time to do it, but I think that's what it was about, really. It was actually mm. taking these strands and trying to weave them into a piece of cloth that was actually quite new, unique. And I suspect that's characteristic of a lot of uh, research mm. work and careers. Really. Mm. Absolutely. Do you want to go on to horror? We go on to horror. Well, we don't really want to go to horror, but we've got to. <laughs> now, when, when I did my masters, I was supervised by Helen Simons, um, who was, had been working with Barry MacDonald. And, you know, what they taught me was how political education research is, particularly if you venture into the field of evaluation. And if you're thinking about improvement, you are making judgments and you are putting value on practices as well. And as soon as you do that, you run up a, a, against um, vested interests, basically, or um, uh, political um, movements or, or uh, uh, strands that are actually going to be difficult, really. And so I learned from Helen Simons and Barry McDonald to think very carefully about the ethics of what you were doing in terms of research. And I think right from the beginning, when I went into a school or where it was a site, research site, I had two short documents. One was a kind of research brief, so I could, in natural language, explain to the people I was wishing to work with what I was intending to do. And the other one was a code of ethics, actually, to saying how I was going to collect the data, how I was going to store and treat the data, how I was actually going to release the data and report and giving them some control, if you like, over some of the, the, those aspects, really, um, without distorting, if you like, the evidence. And so that was actually quite important. And in fact, um, every single project that I've actually worked on has hit a problem. You know, In the very first little tiny review I did of self-evaluation schemes for the Open University when I was in my early 30s, um, I'd actually taken this ethics and I'd been working on um, uh, with schools to get their accounts of their, their work towards self-evaluation. When it was published, the um, local authority director wrote to the vice-chancellor of the Open University where I was working there, complaining about my work because I hadn't cleared it with him. You know, 
But actually, having had that code of ethics and having had a protocol, he didn't therefore had a case at all. But it was, it was quite a shock to me, it, it, you know, just entering the field, to feel this sort of power landing on me. Fortunately, I had Desmond Nuttall working with me, who checked it all out, responded, and it all went away. Another project I worked on was a dental health project, and one of the big messages was about sugar and the effect of sugar on children's health, dental health. And the sugar industry came down on us like a ton of bricks. It was quite, I mean, it was, it was quite astonishing, actually, the kind of power of those industries. Uh, when I worked on the national evaluation of, of um, records of achievement, uh, when we presented a report on vocational, the national record of vocational achievement, if anybody is old enough to remember that, um, we said we had no evidence, no evidence that it was being used in the way that in the sites that we were looking at, uh, in, in, in the sense in which it was intended. In fact, it was seen as a, bo a box that the students could actually take the inserts out and put six CDs in because they then had Walkmans. So they were using it, appropriate for other purposes. The DS wanted us to change that finding and so we had to go back. And I remember Desmond Nuttall working on that. He was prepared to take people to court, actually. He said, if mm. they actually insist on that, we'll take them to court over that. And then, of course, we had the other major thing mm -hmm. that we were involved in. I'm going to let <laughs> Andrew <laughs> talk about that, which is the um, uh, National Curriculum Review Expert Panel that we yeah. haven't mentioned so far. You see, all those examples, it just shows education is about what is and what might be. It's all about becoming something through our children, young people, learners. Um, and so it's contested, as, as we've seen. It is a field that's contested, and, and people are worry about the findings, that, and, and so that there can be horrors when there's kickback. And I was just pottering along, looking at catalogues of which boat to buy, um, and um, enjoying my first attempt at retiring in 2010, and Mary rang me up and said she'd heard from Tim Oates that uh, he'd been asked to get together a little team to advise on the development of a new national curriculum for England. And so this is a, and, and so this was sort of a bit like an invitation to um, get inside the DFE, almost in the changing room of the opposing team, <laughs> and see what they were up to, not only, uh, but advise them on, uh, well, we couldn't really uh, resist that opportunity. Um, Maybe we should have done, because it did become a, a bit more of a horror story. Um, during 2011, we met many, many, many times. I got, I think, 2,430-something emails. Um, we met hundreds of um, teachers and representatives of organizations, um, various subject associations, sectoral organizations. I dealt with the primary folks particularly. We liaised with Ofsted, we liaised with many other bodies. And we provided our advice on how to um, construct a, a, a constructive, you know, new curriculum. Taking at face value the ambition of Nick Gibb and Michael Gove to, to do that in the national interest, as it were. Um, um, so we were optimistic. But what kept coming back was this model um, that had its origins in E.D. Hirsch about a subject-based curriculum. And it appeared that what really they wanted was a, um, a survey of high-performing jurisdictions around the world, a kind of collation of information about how they taught, what they taught in different subjects, which was all to be presented in a big spreadsheet um, and uh, would then kind of constitute the curriculum, particularly, almost exclusively, around the core of English and mathematics. And we, you know, had discussions about this month after month, didn't we? Um, and in the, the summer of 2011, we started to sort of try to put together a, a different alternative set of ideas to, to present to the, uh, the team and so forth. And we had further discussions about it in the September, I remember. Um, anyway, by the time we got to October of 2011, uh, we decided to resign. Uh, and so we um, sent in a resignation letter indicating seven areas of particular concern, including 
the lack of breadth and the way the curriculum was squeezing the arts and music and dance and sports, um, including uh, the prescriptive um, constraints of teachers of a year-on-year subject-based um, requirements, the inadequate emphasis on oral development for young children, because it's going to hit primary education first, the inadequate provision for transition from key stages, between key stages, and particularly the foundation stage, was running relatively independently, had its own review, and how was that to link in? It was no particular connection. Um, ministers from different political parties being responsible for these two things. Um, there was no statement of curricular aims, which we thought was absolutely fundamental. Um, so there was no philosophical or theoretical basis. Um, and there hadn't really, the consultation was not supporting the direction the thing was moving in. So the consultation, it was increasingly apparent, was, was really just a mirage. So um, now, um, Mr. Gove didn't like it when we resigned. <laughs> and um, within minutes, we were called in, <laughs> invited <laughs> to a meeting <laughs> where we had a, a, a long and frank discussion. We'd, we had try, attempted to uh, uh, explain to him the kind of principles on which a, a good curriculum would be based, and in particular for me anyway, that it needed to be, um, it needed to reach between the subject knowledge, which was important, of course, and nobody's denying that, but also the needs of learners uh, at particular ages and, and, and stages of the, of the system. So, and the expertise of the teacher, we argued, is to do with making those connections, and you've got to leave enough flexibility for teachers to move and to be able to do that. Um, and uh, it's no good just prescribing everything. Um, and uh, anyway, so we had this discussion, and he said, well, look, that's great. I understand there's very important points. He's a very polite man. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and he said, would you like to write this up in a report, uh, which we did, um, uh, and that was published. Uh, it was meant to, it was meant to um, be the basis of a, a great debate about aims uh, and about the structure of the curriculum and so forth. It was published on the, um, the, nice. the Monday afternoon preceding Christmas. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> there was no great debate. Uh, it, it was sunk without trace, really, wasn't it? Yeah, he did uh, actually respond and said, you know, uh, the one thing that he did announce was that they would get rid of levels yeah. in the, in the yeah. assessment. And that, one thing, that was yeah. the only thing that we yeah. really noticed. So it went on, everything was quiet, people wondering what the hell was going on. Um, until June the 11th, 2012, when he sent a letter uh, to Tim Oates and, the, uh, and published the uh, proposed curriculum, which basically just focused on the maths and English and prescribed it year by year and w had rather derisory treatment of all the other areas of the curriculum, and they were left to, to later. And we felt that... Uh, you know, the, the work that had been done and the, the problems that we'd identified, almost um, all of them um, remained. Um, One thing that we did do, we didn't, well, we didn't do, um, we didn't tell anybody that we'd resigned no, at all, well, except our partners. Mm. <laughs> at that time, we swore everybody else, you know, them to secrecy, but we didn't tell them. But then I had a phone call around about that June, the following June, from a TES journalist who said, I hear you actually had resigned and so it was one somebody within yeah. who had actually revealed that um, and so I thought well actually if it's out now it's out and so what I going back to Barry McDonald and said you know if you can't make impact on policy and policy then you can at least, at least put it in the public record in the public domain so we collected our series of letters and I wrote a kind of linking um, narrative and put it onto the Bira website, which is it's still there. So if you it's want to there. see the, mm. the series of letters and a very brief background, you can. And Andrew then wrote, and you also at the same time wrote a blog. For, yeah, the, for blog, the blog went up um, and was picked up by most of the um, uh, you know, thinking press um, as one of these kind of you know, experts turn on, on government and everything. And um, I, I argued that it, it was a crude design uh, fatally flawed without considering the needs of learners, um, threat to breadth and balance, uh, hadn't considered the needs of slower learners, had uh, high expectations of being pitched to create failure, um, and it had no flexibility to meet children's needs. And the sadness is, and the reason why this is a horror story, um, is that, um, you know, in a sense, Mary and I were representing our collective knowledge, you know, 
Uh, and so were all the people who contributed in various ways to the consultation. And it was actually swept away, really, by a particular view of knowledge and a particular view of what should be in this curriculum. And now, as we know, we have a situation where there's a high level of stress in, in many schools. We have um, all sorts of mental health problems. The well-being of children is being threatened. Teachers are not feeling as fulfilled as we've got a big churn of our teacher um, uh, community. Um, and the consequences that we foresaw are sadly pretty much um, you know, apparent now. And it seems such a dreadful shame, and that is why it's a horror. You know, one hopes that one day we will have a government with whom we can work as you know, practitioners and researchers working together uh, in the interests of, of, of the country and of the children uh, 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 and all live happily ever after, as it were. But it doesn't seem to be terribly easy because I think the field is contested and education is about what is it today, what should it be tomorrow. And of course that's always going to take you into politics. So there are horror stories and I suppose what we need to do collectively is work out how we manage that process, what stance should we take. It can be depressing, but I think we have to hang on to the old Enlightenment ideal, if you like. We, we, we act to understand on the basis of evidence. We try to use reason to contribute analyses which will improve society one way or another. And I think we just have to hold on to that. Um, and I, I kind of hope that uh, and I feel optimistic that that's what that will happen in the next 50 years, um, although it will be other colleagues taking the baton it. forward. <laughs> and um, then we're going to that, sail off into the sunset. We're sailing off into the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so that, I think, is, 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 is it. There's the, there's the game going on. The field is contested. Um, we've done our best in making a contribution. Um, and uh, we do appreciate very much the, this, this award that has been made um, because it's good to affirm the generation of researchers that we represent and the contributions that we attempt to make collectively because it is all a collective thing. And it's so important to keep working together and avoid the buns throwing. And uh, so thank you very much. Well, thank, thanks so much indeed. We do have a few minutes to perhaps start thinking about how to build on this vast uh, experience that, uh, that we, we've, we've been uh, hearing about uh, uh, this, this morning. Uh, so uh, would anybody like to have a go at uh, a first stab at this? Uh, any, any, any points, any, any questions you'd like to raise uh, for um, and, Andrew and Mary? Sure, Gabriel. Thank you so much. I've just run over quite a lot of the history of my career, actually. I started as a researcher, as Andrew knows, on the TLRP, so I'm one of the 750. Um, and as you know, I'm a Bernstein scholar. Um, and I wanted to take up the point of this horror story. So Michael Young has... Uh, appropriated a very narrow version of uh, Bernstein's uh, references to, uh, well, what they now call powerful knowledge to back up the arguments for a very, very academic curriculum, which is very subject-based. Um, so the contestation has actually continued, you know, within our very field. Um, I mean, I, like many scholars, are trying to write against a particular narrow version of uh, powerful knowledge. But, uh, you know, we are really exercised. What would you say to people like me trying to continue the battle in that way at the moment? I, 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 I'm not opposed to Michael's arguments. Um, and... Uh, but I don't think he's pushing them to the exclusion of um, a, an, a, you know, an authentic learning process. 
Um, and I think that I think we do have to c continue to debate the, the place of knowledge. There's an excellent article in Burge, this latest one that just came out. The first article is on a, a curriculum um, design coming from engineering, I think, but it's, it's talking about the structure of subject knowledge and how it relates to, um, to learning and so forth, which I thought was really very good to see. So I don't think this, this discussion is going to get shut down on one side or the other of this. Like it, the, the reality is these dimensions are all very important. And I think that um, uh, just like, you know, I was talking about how theory has informed my approach to things, and I think in Form Mary's too, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a knowledge structure. And um, if you don't have concepts and uh, you know, ideas, and relationships between these things, and, you know, that, that's really helpful. So I think knowledge uh, and subject knowledge and the, all the, with all that kind of background of it, you know, accumulated over generations, that is valuable. Um, but we have to put it in its place. And if one wants children to benefit from it, you have to work from where the children are. It's no good imagining them somewhere else. You have to start from where they are. And that's the thing that ministers can't cope with because they want a result you know, tomorrow. They've lost control of the economy because it's all globalized. So they're banging on in a macho way around areas that they feel they can control. And education is just picking up some of that flack, I think. So we have to kind of fight back in a principled way um, to offer them a model of, of teaching and of learning and of education which is um, authentic and, and, and empirically grounded. And I do think we could do more. I mean, synthesis of ideas is terribly important in bringing this together so that we can communicate complexity in relatively simple ways. One of the, one of the problems that I think that Minas has had <laughs> was not understanding the difference between if you like, the content of the curriculum and the pedagogy. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's no doubt that there are powerful ideas. And you could say that uh, most, most young people ought to understand. I mean, part of this came out, and the reason why I think Tim Oates was actually chosen, that he was in, um, he was, a, a, as he told it to me, uh, a chief inspector for science, chief examiner for science at Cambridge Assessment came to him and said, can I set a question on photosynthesis? Because it's not in the curriculum, that is the previous curriculum. And yet, if you like, photosynthesis in our world where we're considering uh, uh, you know, the, the challenge of the globe, climate change and so forth, to understand that is actually very important. So in some senses, there are powerful ideas and concepts that most people, if they can, should really learn. But I think there's a difference between that and how they learn it and one of the issues that we have is we had was about the organisation of the curriculum and the pedagogy. And the trouble was that um, ministers perhaps wanted to try go into that area, which is why we've had so much on phonics and all the rest of it. You know, um, they wanted to prescribe more than the content of the curriculum, but actually talk about how it should be taught as well. And that I think is very important for um, the profession to retain. Uh, responsibility for that area. And um, can we just squeeze in one final yeah. brief question from uh, from Dominic, who would like, like to um, raise a question? Well, first of all, I just wanted to say what a privilege to hear you talk um, and to hear, even though I've had the pleasure of working with both of you, just to hear so many things I didn't know. And so thank you ever so much. Just quickly on curriculum, um, uh, I'm fortunate today to be a discussant for Louise, uh, Louise's, you've worked, Mary, you've worked with Louise, haven't you? Um, Haywood's uh, symposium today on the CAMU project. And there's this really interesting period of curriculum development in Wales. I've also recently worked um, for Ireland, and it's, and I've been previously with Scotland, and it's amazing the different relationships mm. there are between policy makers, researchers, and practitioners in these countries on our very doorsteps. And it, it really is um, a horror story that you've told about England, I'm afraid. And, and I'm not pessimistic. <laughs> As I was, you know, the talk was genuine. And, and I still hope that one day England will perhaps will have a better relationship. So just, thank, just to say thank you very much, really. Absolutely. That's a very helpful <laughs>